Hello, everybody. Hi, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Joe. And I'm Jeff. And this is the first video version of our long-running podcast, The Everyday Night. So we decided we're going to revisit a couple of our early episodes just to give people a little update on what we're actually doing. The Everyday Night is our podcast about the application of the historical chivalric virtues to the modern day. So we'll start by just reviewing what those virtues are. And there are many, many lists of chivalric virtues. We're going to pick a few. We've picked a few. We'll, we'll go over those, describe how we, what we think they are and why we think they're important, and we'll go from there. All right, but before we get started, I see something in the foreground of your yes. picture. What are you drinking? I have a glass of Pinot Grigio. And I have a Cote du Rhone. Oh, well, that's Ooh. an interesting. Uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> it's very a very light-bodied wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I don't spill any with my glass disappearing like that, but... Uh, the, We're here in our the virtual wine glass library. of invisibility. I oh. don't remember that from Harry Potter, but I think that's in, a good idea. However, invisible is one of the states of drunkenness. You realize one of the higher states of drunkenness. Past bulletproof is invisible. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. The first level, of course, being charming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in in your own mind, I suppose. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway. Anyway, Cheers here, cheers. Ah, very nice. Good. Okay, so let's get started. Okay. Top of our list, honesty. 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 <clears throat> I think honesty is a foundational virtue because if a person is not honest with themselves about themselves, then it makes it impossible for them to increase in prowess in and to do all the other things to exhibit courage to do all the other display exhibit practice all the other virtues i think honesty known as uh, veritas in latin is fundamental right uh, agreed agreed uh, like you say self honesty being able to to self-analyze and see where you need improvement and so on to keep and yourself that's, motivated. That's often the most difficult, most challenging uh, demonstration of honesty that people have is to be yeah. honest with themselves about themselves. People are often have self delusions that they're comfortable with and everybody's entitled to those, but it's hard <laughs> to progress if you're not honest about where you truly are. It does keep some of us going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a little self-delusion, you know. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, well, you know, you're, you're, that's, you're that's, I think little... that's the second level of uh, drunkenness is self-delusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little self-delusion is what keeps you going sometimes. But Yes. Um, so, and next is courage. Courage. And it requires courage to be honest with yourself, about yourself. Well, courage, uh, one of our, I can't, don't remember the quote now, we have it up as a meme on everyday night that, that courage is the, is the point at which all the other virtues sort of congregate, that, that courage is necessary to enact many of the virtues. Yes, that's true. And, and since we talked about honesty, I'll use that as an example. It's to be honest with yourself about yourself. You have that requires courage, right? And it's that's why it's difficult for so many people. But to be honest with other people also requires courage. It requires several other other traits as well, which we'll get to when we talk about uh, courtesy. So, right. Oh, and by the way, we should mention that these. This list is in no particular order. They're not in a ranking of what's more important or what's harder or easier or anything like that. We just put them all in a list. And 
I think that it's different people, if you ask different people, which is the most important virtue or which virtue they start with, they'll have different ideas. But ultimately, all of the virtues interact with each other. And yes. there's a virtue for that. And we'll get to that at the end <laughs> of the list. Um, <clears throat> inevitably, we will get to inevitably, that. Inevitably, we will get to that inexorably. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, next on the list is generosity. Generosity. <clears throat> generosity. And if, that's, that's, again, one of those sort of compound virtues. Um, as we found that many of the virtues overlap in some ways. And that generosity isn't just in, as in largesse and maybe in period or in the chivalric, the, the, the straight chivalric term of largesse. It's not just being free with your wealth. Oh, no. And in, in fact, the thing that people often most value is your time. And being generous sure. with your time and your knowledge and your abilities and your emotional self, being generous with that is something that people truly value because it's priceless, because it has no material wealth. And there's, there's a generosity of spirit, too, where yes. one can be more forgiving. Um, and I, I always like the fact that in the, the word for um, righteousness and charity are the same Hebrew word. Oh. So, yeah. Oh. So that to be righteous, you must be generous. You must exhibit charity. It's, it's essentially the same, essentially defined in the, in the same way that's part and parcel of, of that state, that it's not possible to separate one from the other. Mm. Um, <clears throat> in fact, my father used to say that um, to be a mensch, you need chutzpah and rachmanis. You need charity, uh, chutzpah, you need courage and compassion, which we'll get to, compassion. But I think generosity requires a certain compassion, a certain empathy. Yes. Why would you be generous if you don't care about people? There's, right. And there are people who lack empathy, and they're called psychopaths, sociopaths, well, depending on the, the level of their dysfunction. Well, yeah, and their ability to fake it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so generosity. Large, okay. no, no, bless oblige included largesse well, we talked, the obligation about, of, of when we spent more time on generosity in, in specific. I think we drew a little bit of a, or I at least draw a distinction between generosity and noblesse oblige. You can, the noblesse oblige is the obligation to be generous if you are of a higher class. If you, are, if you are more fortunate, you are obliged to be generous. But anybody can be generous. It's oh, not certainly. an obligation. It is actually, I think, more virtuous when someone is not well off or, or of some, without some social privilege, being generous is a greater virtue. Yes, and as we talked about when we discussed generosity entirely in one episode, one chapter of our podcast, I did mention that there's a hierarchy of generosity that first is giving giving anonymously yeah and and freely is is the highest level so yeah so for more on generosity see our other podcast <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> so next on the list is prowess and right. prowess is often associated certainly in the the medieval reenactment that we partake in participate in uh, as referring prowess in arms the ability to right. use the weapons and and tools of the martial art in your in in practice but prowess generally simply means uh, a level of expertise of skill and it can be in anything in any whatever right. your chosen craft or skill or pursuit is 
And Abraham so, Lincoln is... And you can use prowess. You can use prowess quite correctly for anything. Yes. And Abraham Lincoln was quoted as saying, if I have four hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first three sharpening my ax. Hmm. And that ties in with something that Stephen Covey wrote in his Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, which I think every other word was copyrighted, every other term, but he, he, his, one of his copyrighted terms was sharpen the saw. And it was about working on your skills. And he referenced, he referenced Lincoln, I think, as saying Lincoln stole it from him or something. But, <laughs> um, <clears throat> sharpen the saw, meaning work on your skills, improve your prowess. And we can, that's a, a very lengthy discussion. How do you recognize expertise? How do you recognize skill in other people? How do you recognize it in yourself? Are you honest with yourself about your own level of skill right. that's required to be able to improve? Unlike some people who claim to have a talent or an instinct or a gut. Yeah. Or something. yeah. Now listen to an expert. Anyway, moving along. Yes. Ah, to, to, as it happens, humility. Humility. Humilitas. So humility is not false modesty. No. As some people often take it to mean or think it means. Humility is an honest, again, comes back to honest, understanding of the reality of right. where you are what you can do, what you can't do. <clears throat> and the, I, I like, and I, I have an analogy. I say that the, the foolish person has a glass of water that's half full and they think they have half of all the knowledge in the world if water stands in for knowledge. And the wise person has a lake full of water and realizes that true knowledge, the scope of true knowledge is all the water in the world or all the water in the universe and realizes how little of it they have, even though they have far more than the person who has half a glass of water. And Dunning-Kruger syndrome, where the less somebody knows, the more of an expert they think they are, Right. It's a perfect example of the lack of humility. Right. And that the Dunning-Kruger scale is a, is a curve. Right? Yes. And yeah. It's a bell type curve that there is a point at which you, you know, as much as you think, you know, and that's, that is true wisdom. You know, exactly. You realize how yes. much, you know, and how much little, how little that is and how, how, you know, much that is in comparison to everybody on the other side of the curve. Yeah. But, so, uh, courtesy, next on our list. Oh, yeah? Yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so, courtesy is not simply being nice. No. In courtesy, fact, it, the term der derives from courtoisie, the, the behaviors expected of someone to be able to be present at court, at the royal court, the court yes. Being yes. And modern courtesy consists of certain rules that I often relate them to logical fallacies. No ad hominem attacks, don't call names. Don't raise well, your, you know. That's in, in argument or debate. We can also- argument, Well, the, Courteous discourse, anyway. Right. There are courtesies like beyond simply how you speak. But that's just one example. Right. And I think a lot of people liken it to etiquette and manners. Etiquette, yeah. But the etiquette and manners are very situational, oh, very sure. specific. The etiquette. And cultural. And cultural. The etiquette of going to a formal state dinner. In right. Buckingham Palace 
is very different than the etiquette of going to uh, uh, someone being invited to someone's house for a barbecue. Right. Or, or a, an intimate dinner in Japan. Right. It's so it etiquette is very cultural. And when we talk about courtesy, it's courteous to understand yes, the etiquette that's what I was at. and observe the etiquette of your hosts. As well as you are able. Uh, yes, as, and, and, and it can be very difficult in Correct. gaining that kind of understanding. I know that there are executive, business executives, let alone um, State Department people, foreign service officers, but certainly business people, when they are about to travel abroad, are coached on how to behave, and what and, to do, uh, what not to do. And uh, uh, cultural attaches are very valuable and often are there right at the elbow of an ambassador or someone who keep reminding them of what the, the etiquette and the pro appropriate manners are. But beyond the, the specifics of the rules of a given situation, it sh it sh I should comment and should mention that etiquette, the whole purpose of etiquette is to avoid situations where anyone might be embarrassed or yes. feel uncomfortable. So etiquette is not simply, are not simply rules made up for their own sake. They are th thought about, people gave them thought about how to avoid uncomfortable moments, making guests uncomfortable. So courtesy, it's courteous to learn those things, but in a, in a general sense, in everyday use, it's courteous to stick to the subject when you're talking to somebody, avoid logical fallacies, use proper forms of address, don't call names, don't raise your voice. In short, all the things that our, our elementary school teachers told us, right? <laughs> right. Or, you know, so. Don't pull their pigtails. Right. Right top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, I hope she turns around and slugs you in the face. Okay. Because, and we talked about that in our episode on um, ethics, personal philosophy, and, and self-defense is, is ethical. Yes. Ethical. Every, the, the affirmative right of self-defense, but self-defense not going beyond that to punishment. So that that's a another longer well, we get, topic. Well, well, we'll get to that in under justice too. Yes, yes. But next on our list so far is propriety, and here's another where what we were just talking about how courtesy and propriety overlap. It's very difficult to teach somebody propriety. It's one of the, what is appropriate in a given situation? That requires people often to learn to read the social cues in, of, right. from other people. And some people just aren't capable of that. And that can be very difficult. But propriety, well, don't, you know, they say, don't, oh, I, I see it all the time. I see people, it used to be considered propriety to dress a certain way if you're going to the theater or the opera or a, a religious right. institution. And it's those, well, those rules along with business dress, formal dress, or, or certain business dress went to business casual, which originally meant you could wear a sport jacket Right. Rather than a suit coat. And then it meant it, it eventually became a polo shirt and khakis. And now a lot of places are jeans and right. t-shirts. So <clears throat> it changes, you know, but I know one, one rule of propriety, in, meaning appropriateness was right. <clears throat> as, as clients, companies when I was in the advertising agency world, as client companies went to a more casual form of dress, we were told if we're calling on the client, never dress more than one level better than the client. 
because you'll make them uncomfortable. Okay. So if their business, if they're wearing khakis and a polo shirt, you wear, you can wear slacks and a, a button shirt and maybe a jacket, but don't wear a suit and don't wear a tie. Right. So, well, and propriety, propriety had, had the element of courtesy. What I'm talking about is that you're trying not to make someone uncomfortable. You are trying to respect, and that's the basis for a lot of these is respect. Yes. You are trying to respect the wishes and the feelings of the people around you in whatever venue or situation you're in. Yes. That's what guides propriety. Yes, absolutely. Right. Good. Um, Let's move on. <laughs> moderation. Moderation. I'll drink to that. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> moderation. In all things, including moderation. Including moderation. Yes. Contrary to Robert Heinlein's um, advice of to enjoy the flavor of life, take big bites. Well, it's not contrary. We determined that also. Right. But occasionally, taking a big bite is the way to taste something. Yes. It, which is appropriateness. Um, <clears throat> but overindulging, being immoderate in your in your behaviors, in your spending, in your habits, <clears throat> is uh, it, it can't be sustained for a long term. It's not considered it's not considered a virtue to be immoderate. Well, no, and in in a a bygone days, they would have, they would have been considered being degenerate and dissolute. Yes. Yeah. You'd simply so, indulge but, everything. And it doesn't, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't necessarily refer to drinking or which a lot of people no. take it to or eating, but think about gluttony and sloth and the, the, the virtues are often talked about in, in terms of their opposites to the seven deadly sins. Right. There are seven cardinal virtues too, but the seven deadly sins. Excuse me. Did you, did you leave your phone on? That actually is ringing through my computer oh. because it, they're connected. So. Oh. Okay. So. So I can answer my phone through my computer. But Not I'm, while we're recording. No, no. <laughs> sorry about that. But I can't mute that and mute. So. Okay. I have to turn it off. So <clears throat> my my apologies. Um, <clears throat> so what were we? We were oh, moderation. 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 So yeah, they are often considered in in opposition to the seven deadly sins, of which law, uh, lust, sloth, um, gluttony, gluttony would be immoderate. Yes. In behaviors. And it essentially it means not taking things to extremes all the time. And and it both means balance. It really refers to balance. Well, and in a, again, in our earlier podcast about moderation, we determined that it's a both ends of the spectrum too. That that yes, complete assiduousness is not good either. That being a complete ascetic may not help. You know your your life either no that's not moderate. that is not moderate either no it, and <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's it really is about balance though sometimes it's good to be <laughs> do something to one extreme or the other extreme but you're looking for balance and balance doesn't mean always at one extreme or the other right that's <laughs> like that's swinging bi- back and forth between extremes. Yeah, it's bipolar disorder. Um, <laughs> but it does mean balancing, balancing things, and 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 that's to, so. So life is harmonious. Excuse me, my my. I think my chair is sinking continuously, so I have to keep adjusting it. But. Oh, okay. So moving on from moderation, we have justice. Justice, justice, wow. justice is not the same as vengeance. No. Uh, no vengeance. It's a bit trickier the, than vengeance, really. It's, 
yeah, vengeance is emotional and and a vengeance is enacted not only on a perpetrator, if you follow the the Italian term for vengeance, vendetta, not only on the perpetrator, but on their family, their their friends, their property, their uh, chattel for yes. seven generations. Uh, whereas justice is intellectual. It's it's cognitive. It's non-emotional. It's supposed to be non-emotional. And the a justice, a just punishment is only enacted against the perpetrator. Right. It's a, it's focused. It is focused. Um, <clears throat> it is um, it, it is sharper and it's a sharp edge. Justice is is depicted with scales and a sword. Yes. Blind justice depicted with scales for balance and a sword, which has a sharp edge and a point. If and there a were a similar sculptor sculpture for or symbol for vengeance, it would be it would have a big ass hammer. A mallet, <laughs> a, like a cartoon mallet, and right. <laughs> and just smash everything in its in its path out of rage. So okay. that's and we all justice is required. Now this may be the point at where we can insert compassion. This yes, might, it might bring us to that point because we we somehow originally initially left that off of our list, and it's incredibly important. And and we had we talked about mercy too, and right, mercy, and I didn't make it either. <laughs> mercy, well, and mercy and compassion, I think, are different ways of saying the same thing. That, well, I think showing mercy is a way of expressing compassion. Yes, yeah. So justice is tempered with mercy, and yes. showing compassion to people is. It's an essential virtue. I don't know how the hell we left it off. It was yeah, I mean, immoderate of us and uh, yes, a dem in, lack of propriety. Inexcusable. Hmm? Yes. inexcusable. So we'll have to do an episode just uh, about uh, yes. compassion and mercy. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it, it's essential. People, and I'm finding it now, um, I'm teaching online as of, five weeks ago all my yeah. in classroom classes went online and um not all students are good at going online and i know it's certainly been challenging and i've been i had to make some a lot of decisions very quickly about the best way to serve the students needs for both the course content but also <clears throat> the current in the current situation what they're what they're what's really of value to them what's right. really of value and <clears throat> so uh, well, you're I mean, having to present i imagine you're having to having to present it in a kind of a condensed form almost and that you have to yeah well uh, i already before the semester started i had the all the powerpoints i use when i lecture in the classroom, those are already posted online. I've got every class I have has a, already has a web component to it. It's a web, <clears throat> web augmented class by the uh, right. web content. So those are all there, but the in-classroom discussions where I ask students questions and I bring up current topics and I ask them to apply the knowledge and I, that's something that, is, really difficult to recreate. So I had to come up with alternatives. And I know some the instructors are using meetings like this as a way of engaging with students, but, and, and some are pre-recording lectures, but that lacks the interactivity and spontaneity that oh, can yeah. occur that be, during the- Even duller, even duller than going to a lecture. Right, a lecture. so- <clears throat> Essentially, what I've done is, I'm I'm writing to them. I like I put up I put up 
discussion questions for them to comment on and interact with each other, but they're asynchronous. They're, they don't have to be in front of their computer at a specific time because I don't know what their circumstances are. Right. And <clears throat> so students that haven't posted, I've written to them and said, hey, is, how are things going? I noticed you haven't posted. And I get emails back and said, you know, I got this situation and sick family members and I'm doing working in a hospital and I'm doing, it's like all kinds of situations. I don't know what their circumstances are and it would be, it'd be a lack of, it would be unjust of me to hold them to the same standards in the current circumstances that I would hold them to same expectations. I would hold them to during right. normal circumstances. You have yeah. to show up, you got to do the work, you have to participate. <clears throat> you knew the circumstance, you knew that what it was and what was required when you signed up for this. And if you couldn't do it, because I lay it all out in the syllabus and talk about it the first day of class, you can't do it, it's not the class for you. Well, the circumstances changed. Yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> Just recognizing that I think shows a certain amount of compassion. Yes. So, and, and we're all we're all tough. having to kind of we yeah. all have to kind of keep that in mind now, right? I mean yes. everybody everybody is having to do things differently. And there's a yes. period of adjustment where we all have to figure out how we are doing this. And just being a little more understanding while people make the adjustment, what does it hurt anybody? Exactly. And <clears throat> Uh, you know, one concept, more or less, one assignment, more or less, one, ultimately, what they're going to get, what any student gets out of class is not just the content, but it's the experience of how the course is conducted. I remember wonderful, knowledgeable, compassionate teachers, and I remember the ones who were jerks. Sure. <clears throat> and they're both different lessons. So. so moving to the next on our list, what have you got? Fortitude. Fortitude. And fortitude and, you know, fortitude and courage, I think, have a great deal in common. Yes. And if we want to keep our list to 12, <clears throat> one or the other of those may go in favor of compassion. Well, I think that fortitude requires courage, but courage can be short, it can be a, a short experience and fortitude is, is endurance. So courage yeah, can be a sprint and fortitude is a marathon. Well, that's why we included both that fortitude, like that courage, like you said, has a uh, element of, Im of immediacy and that fortitude is that grit, stick to itiveness. Yes. That's yes. somewhat different from, than the ability to, to, you know, enter the lion's den takes courage to, to keep climbing through the dark cave takes fortitude. Yes. And I think what people are demonstrating now is both. There's, People are demonstrating courage, but also fortitude. I so I think they're related, but different. They're yeah, I, well, different. Agree. There's a there is a a difference. We established that, or we wouldn't have had to had them separately on the list. I'm just right. I'm just looking for. We we really need to insert compassion, and I I hate to go to a an odd numbered list, even though we have done this with with the plus one that we added. I don't want to have a 13 list with a plus one. It's just. So the plus one should be, it's part of them. That makes us not 12 plus one. It makes us 14. So we so just, we don't have a plus one. We just have a solid 14. Yes. <laughs> nah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And we'll talk about why I'm we'll not sure. We'll talk about that. Do. Yes. Okay. So. Then uh, after fortitude, we have franchise. 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 Um, <clears throat> and while well, diff people interpret franchise in a lot of 
ways. And I have a very specific interpretation, personal interpretation of what franchise means because of the 14th. Yes. Which is what a lot of people take for franchise, but I have a different meaning for franchise. So some people say it's noble bearing. It is, and I, I think, well, you know, that's a culmination of a lot of virtues and I have a specific word for that, which we'll get to. I take franchise to mean it's the simultaneous um, ability and obligation to take positive action for the good. As in yes. exercising the franchise, meaning exercising the right to vote, I, it's, I'm looking at the word franchise from that a meaning that eventually derived into the franchise, meaning the vote, it is that, that right that you have to take action for the positive good. But because it's a right, it's also an obligation. And the, the term is a, a mitzvah, something that's both a good deed and an obligation, it's a mitzvah. Um, and so and that's I think, how I take franchise. And, and yes, and we're, we're, we are only slightly different on our interpretations. And I think it has, when we talk about noble bearing and other people, talk about franchise as the the um enactment of your station well yeah which is very much related to having that right and privilege to take yes. positive action but uh, to me that that assumes that bit of of a superior station now since we don't but in a, in a more egalitarian sense is that if you have the, the position or the privilege or the strength or the power to help someone you should. Yes. It's not just and that I don't you think are able. If you I, are able, you must. Yes. And I, yes, if you're able, you must. And I don't think that requires a social station. No, to do no, no, that. No, no, no. There are plenty of, ex plenty of examples of people who with very little social standing who saw a need and fulfilled it, who rescued someone from right. a car or a train or something. But that what I mean there is they found themselves with the ability to do something. Yes. And felt obliged, therefore, to do it. Yes. So they, and that's, and that's a, I agree. But, uh, but in, in particular, when you, when you know you are in a position of strength, when you are in a superior position and that gives you the ability to do something. You are even more that, you know, you are then more obliged than someone who sees the need and takes whatever steps are necessary, however difficult it may be, that, that is to their greater credit. What I'm saying is if you're, you know, if, if, if you see someone attacking someone weaker, you should intervene if you're strong enough to do so. Yes, yes. Which if you're not strong enough to do so, you, it's that shows great courage that you try to intervene, but that may not have been the wisest course because maybe now you're in the hospital along with the other victim. But I, <laughs> I just I, said I, I was in a um, faculty meeting at another uh, college, not the one I'm teaching at now, where we had a faculty meeting and the person from HR addressed us and was telling us you know, various things and including what to do if a fight breaks out between two students. And this poor woman said, so get all the students out of the room and leave the room and call the for call security and call. And I raised my hand to be recognized and I said, no. And she looked at me and everybody turned and looked at me and I said, First of all, I'm not going to simply leave two people fighting with no witnesses and, and nobody to, to help them or intervene. I'll send students to, to call for assistance. I will stay in the room and observe, but if you're going to intervene in a fight, you have to know when to intervene and when not to intervene. Right. And if generally in a fight, somebody at some point gets an advantage. 
over the other person. The other person becomes right. defenseless. That's the point to intervene because that's the point at which further violence will potentially harm somebody very seriously and intervene at that point, but not before that. Don't jump in between two people who are fighting. That's not the way to, to handle it. But knowing how to intervene in a fight means that I have an obligation to do so at the right time. So I am not going to leave the classroom simply to leave two students to fight. And everybody looked at me and all the other faculty said, yeah, what he said. And then the, the poor woman from HR started backpedaling as quickly as she could. <laughs> well, the, the idea that you need to stay there and witness what actually happened. And in case a serious injury does happen, yeah. somebody needs to be there. Yes. So to at, at least, if you can intervene, at least to render first aid. Right. And to witness as well. Yeah. So. so what's next? Loyalty. Okay. Loyalty. Hmm. <clears throat> so and that's, we talked about that as not just being sort of blind loyalty, but, but meeting your odes and obligations. Yes. If you undertake a promise, if you make a promise, you'll fulfill it. If you, make a uh, swear an oath, make a promise, make a pledge, you're, you're obligated to, to do that. But be, there are examples of loyalty that are unsworn. A loyalty yeah. to friends, loyalty to family, loyalty to... Uh, well, to, I, there are very few beyond that as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well... <clears throat> I, I remember having a conversation with people about loyalty to your employer and yeah. said, well, you know, I'm not in fealty to my employer. I, my obligation to them is to give them my best work and, to, and their obligation to me is to give me the, the, tools, equipment, um, supplies, situation, what I need to be able to, the, to do my best work and to pay me. And, yes. <clears throat> but uh, I, I remember once I was working late at an agency and this, uh, my, one of my coworkers walked past my office and he was leaving and he stopped and he turned and he looked at me and said, you know, Joe, if you drop dead at your desk right now, all they would do is step over your body to reach the phone to call and hire your replacement. I said, well, yeah, I suppose they're not loyal to me, but I'm loyal to my own concept of excellence. Well, that's integrity. That's what yes. that, that's that, that's integrity the Integrity is, is a kind of, loyalty to your own principles. Right. And I had a conversation with an employer years ago. He was, and he was shocked to hear an employee say this. Well, well, yes, while you are working, you are giving the assumption is that while you're working, you are doing your best work and you are giving them a hundred percent of your attention while you are being paid. And the, but uh, uh, we were talking about, Compensation. We were having a discussion about compensation and oblig and, and responsibilities. And I pointed out to him, I said that in a, in a capitalist society that we're in, my job as an employee, my, my goal as an employee, employee is to work as little as possible for as much money as I can get. And your job, your position is to pay me as little as possible and work me as hard as I will allow. That's, that's kind of the adversarial relationship you have. And we come to an agreement where I will work this much for this compensation and you will pay me this compensation as long as my work is satisfactory to this, to whatever level we agree on. And we agree. And once we agree, that is the, the contract we have going forward. And if any 
change in that contract happens, one thing or the other has to change. Yes. Compensation or the expectation. I, I have worked in situations like that, and I really dislike that kind of situation. And I recall uh, working for a company that did a lot of incentive programs uh, in which, you know, people are encouraged to sell a certain number of things or certain kinds of things for getting certain rewards, merchandise or travel. Yeah, or right. And, at, and he, his, the premise in the first part of his presentation that we were required to go to was that people only do the work they do for the rewards they get very much what you're saying. And at the break, uh, I went up to him and I said, I, well, I have a question for you. What about people who are internally driven to do the best they can to do better today than they did yesterday and are constantly seeking to achieve excellence because of their own internal drive? And he kind of stepped back and looked at me and he said, what is it you do for the company? Again, I said, well, I'm an, I'm an art director. That's what I was at the time, I'm an art director. And he shook his head and he said, oh, you creatives, you're not like real people. <laughs> well, and, but see, what you're talking about is how, about the quality of work. And I, like I said at the beginning, the assumption is that I'm giving you the best quality work I can while I'm working. That is, that is a fair assumption to me. Yeah, make. but you also said the least amount of work. And yes. quality takes time. We bill for the hours though, right? I mean, as an, as an artist, you bill for your time. If I can create, and if- This, is, this is a longer discussion <laughs> about- Well, right. But my point was that my employer was shocked to hear this attitude laid out this way yeah, because he just expected you to be loyal because you're getting a paycheck. You should just and take on whatever responsibilities I give you as long as you're in my employ. Which which actually leads to a, an important point. Loyalty is a two way street. Yes, loyalty has to be reciprocated. If loyalty is not reciprocated, that's a breach of the agreement. Yeah. And so, yeah. But, is, so. but if the understanding is that neither of us have to be particularly loyal, all we have to do is be satisfied with our situation. It's not the best, no. but, it's how, but it's, it's how the system is designed, or at least how it has, been, how it has become since, oh, the mid-70s. Yeah, and I don't like it. So, but I'm not required to like it. No, so, <laughs> that's right. Um, do your job. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have so, to like it. Do it. So now <laughs> we come to what you refer to as the plus one of virtues, which I yes. think is the culmination of the virtues because it refers to all the virtues together. We talked about how virtues. And that, and that is why I think it deserves a special place not in the list of individual virtues. That's, well, the that's, why, that's why it's at the end. Yeah. <clears throat> and the, the term, it's an Italian term, sprezzatura. And sprezzatura is difficult to translate. One translation is the, the air of perfect naturalness, the seeming of naturalness in what you do. And that doesn't mean you're faking it. It doesn't mean pretense. What it means is that you have practiced all the virtues so well that you can wear all of them simultaneously as, as if you're wearing uh, clothing and look good in it. And in the same way I've seen uh, during prom season, young men <laughs> wearing a tux for the first time and the tux is wearing them they look completely uncomfortable right. in it because they're not practiced in it there's no naturalness but naturalness they're being natural they are naturally uncomfortable <laughs> that yes, seeming is. naturalness is the result of practice the the baseball player with the what 
people say it's a natural swing or the golfer or the, it's the result of countless hours of repetition and practice and refinement until it looks effortless. And being able to be honest and brave with compassion and justice and exercising franchise and all of these things all at the same time and being courteous, it requires practice at all of them. So said you, it, it's to be able to, to have the courage to speak honestly and the strength to do so compassionately all at the same time with justice in mind takes practice. That is not an easy thing to do all of that simultaneously and hence sprezzatura. And, and I, I don't discount its importance as a goal, certainly. Um, and, and it belongs on our list, obviously. I'm just, I, have, I have resisted just adding it into the list because as you say, it's, it's a culmination. It, all of the others can be um, analyzed individually, but without an understanding of all the others, you can't understand sprezzatura. That's, that's true. But we've also talked about virtues in combination. Yeah. Having other qualities. Yes. Okay. Or creating a compound sort of a virtue. Right. Right. So, so that's what I would, this is. Yeah. It's a compound but, virtue. But it's not in our base list. That's, my, that's all I'm saying. It's not in the base. You know, it's, water is not an element. That's true. It's an important and an elemental compound, but it's yeah. not hydrogen and it's not oxygen. It's water. Correct. That's all. I, that's why I, 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 and part of me <laughs> wants to keep it separate because of the importance of it. Oh, oh, good. Well huh? done. You like that well one? Well done. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> buy it, but I, I like that. I think that was well done. Oh, come on, though. That was, that was an excellent argument, though. It, it was. <laughs> it was. would have been happy with that one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think that brings us to the end of our, our overview of yes. the, the virtues. And we'll continue doing these video versions of our podcast in addition to our, our audio recorded right. versions. Uh, as as appropriate and um, these may not come out as regularly but we've got a few planned and uh, and I think at some point we'll be doing we'll, we'll try doing one of these live where yeah. we can take questions as, as well. we as we get more comfortable with the technology and yes. get our studios set up and yeah don't you I, I think you have a lovely library thank you thank you I had to rearrange some of the books for size but, oh uh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can understand that. Yes, there's the uh, replica of my my uh, the cabinet of my memory. This is my memory palace. Ah, I see. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, you know, I, I wouldn't have put red curtains in your memory palace, but you know, it's a taste thing. So, well, it's it's yeah. you know, it's that's a particular room with particular um, memories. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this. This could represent my memory palace in, you know, in the ways that, uh, you know, it's <clears throat> kind of dark and, and dusty in most What places. were you turning around to look at? <laughs> <laughs> hey, verisimilitude, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not on our list. So. But wasn't it effective, though? Huh? <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, look at that. I gestured, I gestured to the cabinet yeah. there. See? Oh, yeah. Let's well, see if I can open a drawer. <laughs> Okay, sometime I'm actually going to have a little stack of books back here that I'm going to pull out and refer to. So oh, that's, that's good. That, that, yeah. <laughs> as, as if it were on the side table just behind me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this episode of The Everyday Night. Thanks for coming and listening and watching. Thank you for please, joining us. Please like and comment, if you will. And until the next time, be thou a good night. And true.